Welcome to the Word Examined Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Wagner, intern pastor and true crime enthusiast. This season, we will continue to dive into the ultimate true crime story, the life, ministry, and death of Jesus Christ. This is a story you may have heard before, but I hope that with this telling, you can place yourself in the story and consider what it would have been like to shout Hosanna at the triumphal entry, share a meal at the Last Supper, or bear witness to one of the most brutal forms of murder in our history. I'm glad you're on this journey with me. Let's get started. Last time on the Word Examined podcast, we heard about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, from birth and baptism to miracles, healings, and teachings. We covered decades in minutes, but from now on, we will be looking at the final moments in Jesus' life, placing ourselves in the story and considering its meaning for our lives. We will start with the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, a memorable moment in history that, while seemingly joyful and celebratory, would become a pivotal moment that would turn from triumph to treachery in the span of a week. Jesus and his disciples were traveling near Jerusalem and had reached the village of Bethphage, which was located on the Mount of Olives and east of the Jerusalem temple. They would be traveling through this area and landing in Jerusalem for the Passover festival, what would turn out to be Jesus' last Passover there. As they came nearer to the village, Jesus sent two disciples ahead of the rest of the group for a very important task. Jesus asked them to find a colt, the foal of a donkey, to ride into Jerusalem. He tells them that they will find just that when they come into the village. They will find a colt, and Jesus makes an important distinction about this colt in particular. He says that they will find a colt that has never been ridden. Now, wouldn't it seem unusual that in these times where there were no cars or trains, where walking and riding animals were the common forms of transportation, that it would be highly unlikely that they would find a colt that had never been ridden? But they do. And they bring this colt to Jesus for him to ride into Jerusalem. So why does this matter? What is the significance of Jesus riding a colt that had never been ridden? The connection for this moment goes all the way back to the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus preached about and used to teach about God's love and God's promises. You see, riding on the colt was something that was reserved for royalty. In Israel's history, King Solomon had the honor of riding on King David's mule. It was a royal act reserved for someone special. So the fact that Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a colt that has never been ridden shows that Jesus is unlike anyone who has come before, unlike any king or royalty that has come before. The disciples travel into town ahead of Jesus and the remainder of the group to get Jesus his colt. They find one tied near the front entrance of a building. And as they go to untie the colt, some people that were in that area begin to wonder why these people were seemingly stealing this young colt. So they ask, why are you untying this colt? Prepared for a question such as this, they tell them what Jesus had told them. The Lord requires it. And that was it. They let the colt go with these two disciples to the person they would soon be praising in the streets of Jerusalem. They take the colt to Jesus and place their cloaks on its back so that Jesus has something to sit upon as he rides through the city. It is in this moment that Jesus' public ministry has ended. This is the last moment where Jesus would be praised and encouraged by the crowd around him. Within a week, he would be hanging, bloodied, bruised, beaten, broken on a cross for all to see. Already thinking about summer? Give your kids a faith experience of a lifetime by sending them to Luther Park Bible Camp in Chautauqua, Wisconsin, where faith is nurtured through holy play. On the shores of Prairie Lake, your youth will experience engaging Bible studies, 
inspiring worship, and all sorts of fun activities like a ropes and challenge course, swimming and kayaking, games, crafts, and much more. There are a variety of programs for youth of all ages. Go to www.lutherpark.org to register your child today. Consider the juxtaposition of this part of the story compared with how we know this story ends. This first part of what we call Passion Week or the last week of Jesus' life begins with the most celebratory event. As Jesus and his disciples enter the city, something incredible happens. People from all walks of life, from all corners of the city, have come to see him. As they draw nearer, they notice something peculiar. There's something covering the road. They appear to be cloaks. There are also branches from the trees nearby that are on the road. The road is covered with cloaks and branches. But that wasn't all. They were also shouting something, and as Jesus and his disciples drew nearer, they could finally understand the words they were saying. Hosanna! Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna! Jesus, sitting on the colt, looks into the crowd and looks upon all the faces of those who had come to praise him, those who have acknowledged that Jesus is a king, a king unlike any king before. He looks into the faces of men who have witnessed the miracles he has performed and the storms he has calmed. Jesus looks into the eyes of the women who he has shown compassion to when no one else would. Jesus looks into the faces of the little children, whom he welcomed into his ministry, blessing them and telling others of the joy they bring to God's kingdom on earth. Jesus looks into the faces that are filled with joy, eyes welling with hope for a future where they are included and given God's promises. Faces that will be filled with rage, with hatred, and with conspiracy in just a few short days. But for now, they are filled with joy. For now, they look up at him with thankfulness and praise. But, as noted by witnesses to this event, not everyone in the crowd was filled with praise for Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. Some of the Pharisees, those who were strict followers of Jewish law and expected others to do the same, were greatly disturbed by this showing of praise to a man who had healed on the Sabbath, cared for the outcasts in society, and gone against so many of their religious practices. They yelled to Jesus from the crowd, Order your disciples to stop! Make them be quiet! Jesus continued on and replied to them, I tell you, Even if these people were silent, the stones would shout out. Jesus knew at this moment, even if some of the people were silenced by these Pharisees, it would not stop others from praising him. As Jesus continued to make his way through the city, the streets began to take on a different sound. When Jesus finally entered the city's gates, he took notice of something troubling. The entire city was in turmoil. People were changing their tune. Some were even beginning to question Jesus, asking, Who is this man? The crowds who had been praising Jesus and had followed him into the city answered, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth. Jesus sees the city in turmoil and gets off his colt and makes his way into the temple. And what he sees when he gets there is shocking. When Jesus got to the temple, he was overcome with emotion. A place that should be a place of worship and of reflection, a place to give thanks to God for all that God has given them, had become a marketplace. Jesus looked all around the temple and saw people who were buying and selling various goods. Overcome with anger, an emotion that was rarely seen by his disciples, Jesus stormed into the temple and overturned all the tables, sending their coins and goods everywhere. Jesus exclaimed, My house is a house of prayer. 
but you all are making it a den of robbers. For Jesus, the temple was a central place for teaching and proclaiming what God is doing in the world, not a place of business or greed. After disturbing the people in the temple and making his point, Jesus decided he could only do what God had sent him to do. He began to heal and cure those who were afflicted with blindness and illness in the temple. Jesus turned the temple into a place of comfort and healing, the complete opposite of what he had walked into. But not everyone was happy that Jesus was doing these things in the temple. They questioned him. They watched him. They spied on him. And when they thought they had their perfect trap to arrest Jesus and stop Jesus from doing what he was doing, they sent in a group of spies who pretended to be honest, good-hearted people. They approached Jesus as he was teaching and asked, We know that you are saying and teaching all the right things, and you teach God in a truthful way. But we have a question. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to the emperor or not? You see, in asking this question, they were not asking Jesus about taxes, but instead trying to figure out Jesus' allegiance and if he would continue to cause trouble. They thought they were crafty, but Jesus was craftier. Jesus asked them to show him a coin called a denarius. He asked them, Whose head and title are printed on this coin? They answered, The emperor's. Jesus plainly said, Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and give to God the things that are God's. They saw that Jesus had a higher loyalty to God in this moment than to the emperor. And while some were amazed, many were not. As Jesus continued to teach, preach, and heal, you could cut the tension that began to fill the city with a knife. Many people were grateful for Jesus' wisdom and power, but many feared it. Many saw him as a threat. Many saw only one way to get this Jesus out of the picture for the sake of an ordered society, and that was death. They just needed someone to help them. Next week on the Word Examined podcast, we will continue the story as Jesus celebrates the Last Supper with his disciples, the last meal he will have before his death. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time. Our episode today is sponsored by Cloaks Are Us. Thrown your cloak on the road in an act of praise? Put it on a donkey and have never seen it again? Stop by Cloaks R Us. We have cloaks for all shapes and sizes and styles in the latest fashion. Also, check out our vintage cloaks, like our famous Technicolor Dream Cloak, modeled after the famous cloak Joseph wore before his brothers sold him into slavery. Visit Cloaks R Us today. Thank you for listening. This podcast was written, recorded, and edited by Katie Wagner. The Word Examined Podcast. Available on Anchor Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify.